Hello there, and welcome to the Modern Divorce Podcast. This is Billy Tarasio, and today I am joined by expert witness Christopher David. Our discussion today is going to be a little bit more technical than some of the other discussions that we've had. We're going to be talking about valuing professional goodwill and professional practices during divorce. Christopher, thank you, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Billy. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into this fairly technical but very important episode, anybody who is a professional who's thinking about getting divorced really does need to hear this episode for sure. But can you tell people a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. Um, I am a certified uh, business appraiser. I have about 21 years of experience. And prior to this, I started off as an auditor at Ernst & Young uh, back in 1999. I like to say that I served a two-year sentence in the audit, audit, the Ernst and Young Audit Department of Corrections. Mm-hmm. I knew I didn't want to be an auditor the rest of my life, so I migrated over to the field of valuation. And so I've been valuing businesses professionally for about 21 years. And um, in the past uh, 11 years, I started my own practice, and I've been focusing in the healthcare space, valuing physician practices and other medical type facilities uh, for the past 15 years. And so I am a former CPA and I'm what's called, uh, I'm accredited in business valuation and I'm an accredited senior appraiser. That's fantastic. So when doctors get divorced, they are either um, on their own and they own a practice or they are a W-2 employee and they work for somebody. Now, when you're getting divorced and you're a W-2 employee, things are pretty easy. We can figure out how much money you make and that might be an issue for spousal maintenance. But when a doctor owns a practice, things get a lot more complicated because then we're not just looking at salary, we're also looking at the asset of the practice. And that is where you come in. Absolutely, yes. So it's not so easy valuing this this nebulous thing called uh, goodwill. Uh, there are um, goodwills broken up into two elements. There's professional goodwill, which is also referred to as personal goodwill, which is value to him, pers- him or her personally. And then there's what's called uh, enterprise goodwill or commercial goodwill, which is the value that's attributed to the practice and all the other, let's call it all the other intangible stuff that goes along with it. And we can talk more about that. Sure. And so when you're valuing a business um, in Arizona, personal goodwill is divisible. It's community property. So that means, you know, if you have been married a long time to a doctor and this doctor has, um, you know, a reputation and a book of business and he or she has been, you know, a successful doctor in the Phoenix Valley for a long time. Uh, that concept is going to be valuable as goodwill and will create some sort of a buyout to the non-doctor spouse. That concept is just mind-blowing in and of itself. Right, right. So um, and so you're saying in Arizona, the professional goodwill is part of the marital assets. It is. Yes. Um, I I can see where that's, in some states it's not. Um, In some states they say, well, no, the the professional gets to keep his earning potential in his own goodwill. And so that that can't be divided amongst the spouse. But you're right, that can be aggravating and and mind boggling. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a way to capture that when doing evaluation. Well, let's talk about that. How do you determine someone's goodwill? Okay, well, you can first value the practice using a multiple of earnings. So you look at the, uh, the cash flow or the EBITDA of the practice and you apply an appropriate multiple to that. And that gives you the enterprise value of that practice. So that value represents everything in that practice that generates income. That could be everything from a good reputation in the community, the physician's bedside manner, the physician's uh, uh, reputation and referral network where other doctors refer patients to him. It could uh, be um, 
a, a particular trade name or if they have a unique phone number. It also includes a, a really uh, well-trained and competent staff of physician assistants or nurse practitioners that help produce the work. So it includes the entire, um, all the assets that that company has that generates that, uh, the earnings. And so when you use a capitalization of earnings approach or a, or a multiple of earnings, uh, it produces a value that includes all of the goodwill of the company. Mm -hmm. commercial goodwill and the physician's professional goodwill. Now, clients are always asking me or always looking online to figure out, you know, what is the easy way to value a business? Can I take two times gross revenue? Is it a multiple of the, uh, of the taxable income? If you were to answer that question, if somebody is starting from scratch and they don't want to get a valuation, how can they get an idea of what their valuation might be? Well, that's a tough question because um, I wouldn't say that there's a rule of thumb uh, to use uh, because if you look at the taxable income of a professional practice, it's going to be really low because most physician practices are structured as professional corporations and they by design bonus out most of the income so that they can report a small taxable income because it's a professional corporation and subject to double taxation. So I, I, would, I would say, no, don't look at the taxable income. I think you have to look at um, a cash flow or what they call the earnings EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, and you use a multiple of that. Uh, I'm going to say, you know, just broadly speaking, three to four times an EBITDA, an EBITDA figure. And again, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, amortization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really, that's really a tough one to answer. Uh, mm -hmm. An easy, an easy way to value a business. Um, because there are also some adjustments in there that you need to make. Sometimes you need to adjust for the physician's salary. A lot of times he's going to pay himself um, a lot when it should be adjusted to, to be commensurate with his actual productivity. Sure, because the higher the compensation, the lower the potential business value. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this exactly. is something that people have a hard time getting around. Uh, their head around. Um, if your income is very, very high, then the total profits, of course, will be lower. And if the profits are lower, then the multiple of the profits is also lower. So the business value or the buyout will be lower. So determining the proper salary is another issue that we end up fighting over a lot. Right. That's exactly right. So when we value a, a physician's practice, we look at their productivity to adjust their compensation. So we'll look at their work RVUs or their professional collections or their number of office visits. So there's several metrics we use in the healthcare space to measure a physician's productivity. And then there are um, surveys, independent surveys done for a multitude of specialties that tell you what a physician's salary or reasonable compensation should be based on their productivity. And so you adjust that. And most of the time in a small physician practice or a two or three, you know, a two or three physician practice, they're likely going to um, pay themselves in excess of their productivity. And so once you adjust that, you're basically adding profit to the bottom line. Now, and from a lawyer perspective, you really need to understand this because if the income is being written down to increase the value of the business, you need to account for that in any spousal maintenance analysis to reduce the spousal maintenance that you might have to pay if you're buying somebody out for those same dollars in terms of a business value. So no double dipping. One way or the other, you got to make sure that it's going to be fair. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, yes. So if the business appraiser is going to adjust the physician's compensation, which increases the value of the business, 
then it, it, it makes sense and it's fair to use that new lower compensation for the physician to, to compute the uh, maintenance and child support. Now, this can seem like half a, half a dozen, six of one, half a dozen the other. It can seem like it doesn't matter, but it does matter. I recently worked on a case where this was the exact issue and two business valuators valuated the company and they came out over $500,000 different between one and the other. So there is a huge range of value that you can come to as a business valuator. And that difference, you know, if we're talking about a buyout or spousal maintenance can be absolutely massive. Why do you think there's such a difference in where valuations can come out? You know, I think the biggest difference is that the appraisers aren't using the same assumptions. Mm -hmm. I think it's important when you have opposing experts that um, you at least, they at least be working off the same assumptions, mm -hmm. um, if, if that makes any sense. I, mean, I know they're both looking at the same set of financials, hopefully, um, but I would imagine in your case, the difference was, was probably attributed to the compensation, the physician compensation. I don't know, but I would imagine it, it, it probably was. But I would say the biggest difference would be a difference in, um, in the assumptions being used. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what evaluation is. It's a set of assumptions. What do we think the future growth of the industry might be? That's one assumption. Right. And the other, the other issue that, uh, that I want to add is that a lot of times in small privately owned businesses, they run a lot of personal expenses through there. Absolutely. And so um, you want to make sure that that hasn't been abused, that they're not, they're not you know, um, paying for vacations out of there. There's several, you know, thousands of dollars of expenses for vacations and cars, and you're, you're, you're employing your son for an excess amount of money. So I think there needs to be some discretion there on adjusting that. Uh, the, um, the way I like to look at it is, um, you know, if I, were to, if I were to buy that business, that, that practice, what expenses would I have? Right. I, know I, have to, I know I have to hire another physician. And then um, what other expenses will I have or will I not have? So this is great. And this is what people talk about. There's a lot of different business valuations approaches. And one of them is the, the market approach, which is what people are familiar with, with houses. You look at comps, what are other houses in the area selling for? And what you're talking about, and, and this is Arizona standard, Arizona standard is what is the market value for the business? And you determine that with your exact assumption. If it wasn't you, if it wasn't this particular business owner, how would they run the business? And then we have to figure out what those assumptions might be. Now, that's a lot of what ifs. Yeah. Yeah. So under the market approach, there are um, databases of transactions of special of, of physician practices being sold. And they provide what's called a goodwill multiple. So um, and it gives, this is a database where business brokers and other I guess other people involved in the transaction, they submit this data to the Goodwill Registry anonymously just to record the specifics of the transaction. And what they provide you is a, a multiple of revenue of what the, all the intangible value is in the practice. And so that would be a market approach. So again, it's a multiple of the revenue and that gives you all the intangible value in the practice. And from that, you add the accounts receivable, the cash, and the value of all the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the best source of a market approach in, in valuing physician practices. What I often see in business valuations is that the business valuators will look at many different methodologies. They'll analyze the market approach. They'll analyze the capitalization of earnings approach. They'll analyze the tangible asset approach. And then they'll weight these various approaches to come up with their number. Is that what you do as well? I do that sometimes. Uh, what, a, what an appraiser should do is you should consider all three approaches, the market, the asset, and the income approach. And then you should sort of synthesize them or weight them. They should theoretically they should all be the same. Mm 
theoretically. Mm. If one of them is way off, then you have a problem. You should go back and take a look at that or you're missing something. Okay. But in, in this particular case, um, you, you can, you could possibly use all three methods. And for example, in the, in the asset approach or what they call the cost approach, you could, um, you could begin to value the different pieces of a physician practice by looking at the tangible stuff first, the equipment, the accounts receivable, the cash, any prepays, then you can value the intangible elements. And the most likely intangible elements are the uh, trained workforce, uh, the patient medical records, um, possibly your computer systems and your, your, ER, your um, EMR platform that's in place. So you can build up a value that way. But, but to answer your question, you can, you can use and, and you can apply all three, but you really need to uh, sort of synthesize them and make sure they're all kind of similar. And um, if one of them is out of whack, then there's something wrong with that method. Okay. At what point in a case should people engage with an expert? Should you wait until negotiations have failed or should you try to do this early on? What do you think? Well, um, that's really sort of an attorney question or for the, for the, for the clients, but it seems to me that um, at the point where both parties vehemently disagree on the value of the business, then I think it's a good idea to, to hire an expert. And the expert is there to be a third party independent um, expert to assist the court. And so um, I think at the point where the parties just vehemently disagree on the value, if they're, if they're too far apart. That's a great point. You know, if, if you and your spouse are looking at the, at the practice and you're looking at all the numbers, the spousal maintenance numbers, the buyout numbers, and you're within, you know, 50 grand, you probably don't need a business expert. If one spouse thinks this business is worth $3 million and the other, and the other spouse is thinking it's worth something like $300,000, that's when you really have to bring in an expert. And then at that point, I think it's probably better sooner rather than later. Right. Yes. That's right. So, and then when you're doing these various approaches, well, actually, before I go on to that, I want to ask you, when people are working with an expert, what are some tips for how we can best utilize someone like your expertise? Um, I would say um, the more documents and the more data, the better. If um, if an appraiser has enough information to make an, an informed judgment and decision on, on the business, um, that would be that that would be best. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably the best way to answer that is having enough information. If one side is not very cooperative and is not giving all the information, um, then the appraiser can only do is as best as he can with the limited information he has. Mm, okay. Okay. And how long does it typically take you to complete a valuation? Three to four weeks from the time that I receive all the information that we need. Okay. So, um, yeah. And then a lot of times, Billy, when we get documents, then that generates more questions. We look at the documents, then we'll have more questions. But I'd say three to four weeks um, from the time that we get all the data, all the financial statements, all the proper documents that we request. Okay. And how often are you getting into a business valuation and then finding hidden accounts or hidden money? Does that happen a lot? No, Billy, because as an appraiser, our job is not to find those things. If we stumble upon it, you know, we, we, we could probably disclose it. But um, we don't have a duty to audit or to find fraud. Um, we're just providing an opinion. Okay. And so we do evaluation and we issue our opinion on the value of that business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, what we do see is uh, a lot of spending on non-business related things. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, you got to travel for your education. You know, they happen to hold a lot of conferences in Hawaii, of course, right. with your family. I mean, it's all very logical and, you know, it's really allowed with the IRS, but it may make an impact on, on the value of the business. So it's not surprising that those are things that people end up fighting over a lot. Right. Do you find yourself working for the practice owner or the spouse more often? Uh, it's a mix of both. Um, I, I don't. I don't normally. I don't hold myself out from one side or the other. Okay. So um, it's just it's a little bit of both. Okay. And um, is your do you find that your strategy is very different if you're hired as a rebuttal expert as opposed to the initial evaluator? The, um, the rebuttal expert, if I'm hired as a rebuttal expert, I'm usually, I guess, poking holes in the other experts um, report where I think their shortcomings or their problems. That's really what, a, what I do as a rebuttal expert. Um, and so it's not a, a full blown business valuation. They're just points to challenge and possibly negotiating gambits because Evaluation is an estimate. You know, fair market value is not one precise number. It's an estimate. So it's a range. So I believe that fair market value is within a reasonable range. Um, there's no one right number, but there's plenty of wrong numbers. That is such and a so, good point. Yeah. And so an appraiser will always use judgment and estimates and, um, and approximations. Mm -hmm. And so as a rebuttal expert, I will identify those elements that, um, uh, that are contestable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, um, I'm working on a, a couple right now, the other side is, is getting their own expert. And generally what I hear is, well, you know, your experts submit their, their report and you submit your report and then the judge will likely split the difference. Mm -hmm. I, I hear that a lot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Are there any red flags that you think people should look for if they get a valuation back that just doesn't seem right? Um, you know, those, those red flags would come up if you don't use a, a certified business appraiser. I would encourage people that are in divorce and that have sizable assets. Um, that's really a subjective word there, but I don't know if you have a business that's, you know, worth 500 to 750 or higher, then I would suggest using an appraiser who is, uh, who is certified and, and trained in valuing businesses. A lot of divorce attorneys, they like to use a local accounting firm or a local CPA who could do a calculation. There you would find some red flags because those, those people are not, uh, have not been officially trained and don't have credentials. I'm saying if you use someone who doesn't have credentials, then you may see some red flags. I completely agree with you. And I think that there's a lot of people who do valuations, but valuing professional corporations is, is different. And it is a real niche. It's not the same as valuing a landscaping company or, or a construction company. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to ask you about is what is the difference between valuing a professional corporation that's taxed as a corporation and an LLC that is not taxed as a corporation, but has passed through income? Well, the big difference there is, um, is, the, is the tax, the tax issue. And so uh, every appraiser is a little different and it may be, I'm not certain, but it, it, it may be within each state's um, tax code, but we call it tax effective. So do you tax affect the earnings, the, the earnings or not? Even if you're a taxable um, PC, professional corporation, or if you're an LLC, we first look at the earnings pre-tax. We first look at the earnings pre-tax. And so the value would come out different if you tax the earnings and then apply your, your multiple. So, um, Again, that's the difference, um, and perhaps that should be agreed upon by both sides, is should we tax affect the business or should we not? Ooh. And so if you have two, um, so um, if you have two appraisers, I think that's a very important assumption to agree upon up front. 
Okay. I, I tend to use taxable income. Okay, so let's let's flesh this out. Um, I we've I've got a doctor who's a client, and his business is taxed as an S corporation. Um, what that means is that the business doesn't pay individual tax, but the income from the business flows through to my client's individual tax return. That is correct. So yes, the, the corporation, the S Corp does not pay a tax. They don't have a corporate tax. You're right. So his annual income, his annual taxable income is $300,000. Let's say he has a salary on top of that of $150,000. So his total compensation is $450,000 a year. Mm -hmm. When you're valuing that practice, do you take those numbers, that $450,000, or do you take the $300,000 less whatever tax he would have to pay on that? Let me think about that for a second. Um, if I'm valuing the entire practice, I would probably tax effect add a tax to the 300,000 to the taxable or we call it we'll call it a pre-tax income on that S corp position practice. So I would I would probably tax effect it. Okay. Yes. So that's going to make a massive difference in the value. So this this assumption is could really make a huge difference in the value because if we take a multiple of the 300 Right. If we take a multiple of the 300 and we and we put that multiple at three, you're at nine hundred thousand dollars. If we take a multiple of the taxed portion and let's take out a third, now we're now it's you know three times two, we're at six hundred thousand. So we have a three hundred thousand dollar difference based on this one assumption. Right. Yeah. It it could have a sizable impact. And again, I think that's an assumption. That's something that that the, both parties should agree on, and the experts should weigh in on. Well, let's take this example a little bit further. How does the issue of goodwill affect this particular hypothetical's value? Um, well, you still start with the value of the corporation. Um, and again, uh, you, you would, whether you use a taxable income or not, your multiple of earnings and would, would have to reflect a taxable earnings or not. So we, we typically will use a discounted cash flow methodology with an appropriate discount rate. That discount rate should reflect either taxable cash flow or non-taxable cash flow. So again, we first value the entire entity and that gives us the entire value uh, of all the goodwill. Okay. So, um, you know, Again, in the state of Arizona, if, if all the goodwill is part of the marital estate, then um, we don't have to carve out the professional goodwill. Right. So That's I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, but um, the goodwill is what it is when you value the enterprise. So it goes back to, do we use a taxable earning stream or a non-taxable earning stream? Right. Uh, so, of course, the higher the value, the, the higher the likely goodwill. Right. So in real life, in our example, if the um, physician who's making a total compensation of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we're calling one hundred and fifty of that salary and the rest of its profits from the business, the the goodwill number is part of what leads you to be able to make that $300,000 above and beyond your salary, right? So that's where the goodwill is already baked into the earnings methodology. Okay, could you ask that again, please? Yeah, sure. Because this is a hard thing to get my head around. Okay. So in our example, where the doctor has $300,000 in profits that pass through to his tax mm -hmm. and he makes $150,000 salary, the $300,000 in pass-through profits is a product of goodwill among absolutely. other things. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So when you're looking to carve it out, it's already baked into this additional profit that you're receiving. Um, excuse me. Yes, that is correct. The, the earnings of that business 
it already has the goodwill baked in because think of it this way, Billy. Um, it's everything, all, all the elements, everything a part of everything of that practice helped generate that earn those earnings. His goodwill or his name in the in the community, his relationship with people at the country club or his referral networks, et cetera. So you're right. That 300000 that the company that the practice earned that flows through to his tax return includes his his goodwill. All right. Now let's say um, this husband doctor has recently gotten a DUI and might lose his license and might go to jail. Ooh. How does that impact goodwill or the value of the physician practice? Um, wow. Okay. So we would call that a we call that a specific company risk. At that point, there's a there's a great deal of risk. Um, for the practice, if it's assuming this is a, a single position practice and we know at the time of the valuation that you said he had a DUI and he might lose his license, he might. Right. Yeah. Um, of course, valuation is, is forward looking. So we have to look at the potential income that that practice can generate. Well, if we know that there's a really good chance that um, that the, the physician's gonna lose his license, yeah, that would lower the value of that practice. Depending on if, if we have the valuation date as of today, and we know that, that he may potentially lose his license. If all those events line up at the proper valuation date. Yeah, if that's an existing fact at the time of the valuation, I would say that's a significant risk factor. Okay, and would therefore lower the value. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, if there was a true legitimate risk that he's going to lose his license, I mean, who's to say that uh, he just has to pay a fine and and that's it? Right. So, how big of an impact that makes on the value is really a judgment call you have to make. It is, but I, I needs to be an informed judgment call. I need to, I need input from the client. What's our true risk here? I mean, uh, when's the doctor going to, you know, go into court and um, is he really, really likely to lose his license? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never had that question asked. And um, it's, I mean, it's a legitimate risk factor and we'd have to explore it more. But yeah, I mean, if, if that risk was truly legitimate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is student loans. So many times professionals like doctors or lawyers or other professionals will have a massive amount of student loan debt. How does that impact the value of the business? Um, I've never run into that, Billy. If it's not on the on the books of the business, we, we normally don't pay attention to it. So it's if we don't see it on the books of the business, mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be reflected. Mm -hmm. So to me, this is a real opportunity for a divorce attorney to be paying attention to these two numbers because in Arizona, at least, um, student loans are paid by the person who has the degree. But if I own my, my um, you know, I own a law practice, but let's say I'm a doctor and I own my own doctor's practice and there's a value and I have to buy out my husband, but I also have to pay off my student loan debt. Mm -hmm. Arizona is an equitable distribution state. And I would ask that the judge in Arizona take a look and offset perhaps the value with how much is owed in terms of the student loan. Because if you think about it, a student loan is sort of a business loan. I know it's not technically a business loan, but I think you can, one can make the creative argument that this is a loan you took in order to be able to, um, to, to practice, to work in your profession and you have to pay it back. Yes, you know, this is not specifically a business valuation question, but I, I can definitely weigh in with my opinion on this. Um, you know, if, if the physician's professional goodwill is is part of the marital estate. I would tend to say that the student loans go along with that because it's those loans that helped him or her achieve that goodwill. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be my opinion. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any case law on it, but you and I, we think we should make some law. <laughs> yeah, again, um, without that education, that position couldn't have um, developed that, that professional goodwill. Right, absolutely. But let, but let me ask you a question now, Billy, <laughs> if I may. Um, you know, my experience with divorce is that, uh, you know, you, you throw everything in a pot. We throw all of our assets and we throw all of our liabilities in the pot. And we just divide it up. You take this debt, I'll take this debt. If you're going to take this car, you take the car note related to that. And I'm going to take the Mercedes and I have to take the car note related to that. And you just kind of divide it up. Um, so how would it be any different? Well, it's a great point. Typically, student loans um, are attached to the person the same way the loan is attached to the Mercedes. So typically, I walk away with my law degree or my medical license, and I am responsible for paying the loans in my name that I took out to get that degree, which makes perfect sense, but not if you're also buying out goodwill in a practice. So this is where I think lawyers have a real opportunity to at least capture this argument um, so that the, the, the impact to the business owner can take into account that existing loan. Okay, well, let me, um, let me ask you one more question, Billy. So how long have you been practicing? I've been practicing since 2005. So I think we're at 16 years. Okay, so you've got 16 years. So you've got some professional goodwill that you've built up. What if you and I get married tomorrow and then we get divorced next year? Am I entitled to your goodwill that you developed before our marriage? That's what does Arizona state law, what does a state statute say to, to the goodwill that you developed? Uh, isn't, that, isn't that a separate property claim? So in Arizona, this gives rise to a Ruschenberg claim. And this is the concept that if, if I own a separate property business or I have any separate property and then I get married without a prenup, which I do not advise, but let's say you do that, some portion of the growth during the marriage could be attributed to my effort during that time. Okay. And my effort during that time would be community effort if I don't have a prenup. So the bottom line is this is a significant risk that business owners need to think about before they get married. It's easy to assume I owned it beforehand, so it's all mine. And in Arizona, it's simply not that simple. Yeah. Now that would be um, a hell of a task to look at the growth in the goodwill value. Absolutely. If you have a, if you have a professional that gets married you know, late in life after they've already been practicing for 20 years and developing their goodwill. And so they get married and they stayed married for 10 more years while he or she works. Yeah, that, that you'd have a hairy case on your hands at that point. We do. That's why we have a lot of case law on it. Um, and there's not a lot of lawyers who have who have had this particular fact pattern, but it is one that we've litigated at Modern Law. Um, I would like to know from you, we just have a couple of minutes left. What sure. else do you want people to know about valuing physician practices, valuing professional practices and working with experts? Uh, I would say if definitely if you're in a situation to, um, well, first of all, if you're valuing a physician practice and goodwill, I think you should hire a, an, a, and a business appraiser who has credentials and has been trained and certified in business valuation uh, and not just a CPA or an accountant. That, and then um, I would say um, have the experts or both sides agree on the particular assumptions. Which approaches are you gonna use? Which, appro which approaches do, uh, um, does the state statutes disallow? I know that in, in one state that I'm working at now, and I'm working on a case now, uh, the state statute doesn't like uh, an earnings approach to determine goodwill. They'll, they like to see only a market approach where they've seen uh, uh, another physician pay goodwill for a practice. So I would say um, agreeing on the methods and any other significant assumption for the for the for the practice well this has been absolutely great thank you so much we're going to make sure that your contact information is in the show notes so that lawyers and individuals can contact you directly now do you typically get hired directly by individuals or often through lawyers uh, a little bit of both um 
So most of the time I get hired under attorney-client privilege, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I prefer under attorney-client privilege. All right. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. I know my head's spinning, so we're going to get this all written out into a nice and easy digestible format. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Billy. I enjoyed it.